Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth in a series of community sessions uh, for the search for a new school superintendent for Boston Public Schools. My name is Denise Snyder. I'm the acting chief for the Office of Family and Community Advancement. My colleague, Miriam Ortiz, from the Office of Community Engagement, will join me in supporting today's conversation. We are also offering interpretation today. Miriam, may I ask you to introduce our interpreters, please? This is Miriam speaking. Good morning. Please welcome our interpreters for this morning. We have Ahmed, our Arabic interpreter. Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Arubai. I will be your Arabic interpreter today. Marhaban. Ana ismi Ahmed Arubai. Ana muterjim al-lugha al-Arabiya li hada al-yawm. بإمكانكم استماع إلى الترجمة باللغة العربية من خلال الذهاب إلى أسفل الشاشة ستشاهدون علامة الكرة الأرضية وضغط على هذه العلامة وستظهر لك اختيارات اللغات قم باختيار اللغة العربية وعندها ستمكن من استماع الترجمة كاملة شكرا جزيلا Thank you Miriam Thank you We also have Wei, our Mandarin interpreter Thank you ma'am Good morning everyone My name is Wei I will be your Chinese Mandarin interpreter today 大家好，我是您的普通话同声翻译为。如果您需要同声翻译的话呢，请点击屏幕底部的地球仪标记，然后选择中文Mandarin选项进入翻译频道，啊，就可以听我这个翻译。如果您使用手机或者平板电脑，
Good morning. My name is Angel. I'll be your French interpreter today. Bonjour, je suis Angel. Je vous serai votre interprète française ce matin. Et pour accéder à l'interprétation en français directement, allez au bas de votre écran. Vous allez voir le globe et cliquez sur le globe. Vous allez choisir français. Quand vous choisirez français, vous serez en mesure d'écouter la réunion directement en langue française pour vos questions ou quoi que ce soit. Merci et bonne écoute. Uh, thank you, Miriam, and back to you. Thank you, Angel. All right, and please welcome Randolph, our Spanish interpreter. Hello, everyone. Hola, todo el mundo. Mi nombre es Randolph Domínguez. Voy a ser su intérprete el día de hoy en el idioma español simultáneo. Para accesar el idioma español, por favor, mirar en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Van a encontrar allí un icono como un globo terráqueo y van a pulsar allí, seleccionar el idioma español. Si están utilizando una, un celular o una tableta, buscar tres puntos y van a pulsar allí y seleccionan el idioma español como su idioma de preferencia. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Uh, also, we have we are Vietnamese interpreter. Thanks, Maryam. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vi. I will be your Vietnamese interpreter for today's meeting. Kính chào quý vị, tôi tên là Vi. Tôi sẽ là thông dịch viên của quý vị ngày hôm nay. Xin quý vị nhìn vào màn hình và tìm ở dưới, tìm tiếng Việt, Vietnamese. Bấm vào đó để nghe được thông dịch viên dịch lại cho quý vị hiểu. Cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Fatima, our Somali interpreter. Hi. Good morning. My name is Fatima Hassan. I'm Somali interpreter for the day. Valuan <laughs> So, Kaz Ayan Mark, Tinagala Hadiri San, or in Kagatur Jumia, or Mahat Sintahai. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Libyan and Kylie as our ASL interpreters. You can see them waving on the screen. A note to our participants <clears throat> that if you would like to have the ASL interpreter box larger, you can pin this panelist by clicking on the three buttons in the top right of the box, of that box, and select the word pin. And I'll now pass it back to Denise. Thank you, Miriam. This is speaking. We'll now turn on the interpretation feature. Please note that everyone needs to join a channel, including English speakers. So if you want to listen to the conversation in English, for example, please join the English channel by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. To support our ASL interpreters, please name yourself before speaking today. Please also share your neighborhood and your affiliation with BPS. Once again, good afternoon or good morning, I should say, and welcome. Today's meeting, including a transcript of the chat, is being recorded to serve as a resource for search committee members and to make available for those who cannot be here today. Again, both the chat transcript and the Zoom recording will be available for the public on the superintendent search webpage for the Boston Public Schools. Search committee members will be considering comments in a few forms through public comment, as we're doing here today, in the chat from today's event. You can also submit via email. You can also do a video recording. In this listening session, questions will not be addressed directly. Rather, committee members will be listening to your input if you have questions about the process or you'd like to email your comments, you can email to superintendentsearch at bostonpublicschools.org and we'll be putting that address in the chat several times today. Before I turn the session over to our hosts for today, I'd like to share some session norms for our time together. We ask participants to be open 
to new or different opinions, respectful of each other's voices, and focused with comments specific to the search for our next school superintendent. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our search committee hosts for this morning, Councillor Julia Mejia, Chair of the Boston City Council's Education Committee, and Dr. Carlene Pignato, Head of School at the Channing Elementary School and member of the search, Superintendent Search Committee, who will formally kick off today's session. Councillor Mejia. This is Councillor Mejia speaking. Um, thank you, Denise, um, and welcome everyone to the fourth and I believe the final community listening session. These sessions are critical opportunities to gather feedback from families, students, community partners, and the general public regarding the qualities and characteristics that we're looking for um, and we wanna see embodied in the next superintendent. The search committee has been tasked by the school committee to conduct a thorough search. I cannot empathize how, uh, enough how much um, we need and count on your input. I'm incredibly impressed by how many people have shown up today and really grateful for your participation. To date, these listening sessions have included nearly 600 participants and we are eager to engage in a full search for the right candidate. And this begins with hearing from you in um, these listening sessions. Before we get into the agenda, I'd like to briefly introduce members of our search committee and school committee who are present to hear from you this morning. Dr. Pam Elginger, president of the Bunker Hill Community College and co-chair of the search committee. Ms. Roxy Harvey, chair of the BPS Sped Pack. Um, Ms. Lorena um, Lepera, who's the co-chair of the search committee. Mr. Marcus McNeil, a senior at Fenway High School and also the co-chair of the um, search committee. Mr. Michael O'Neill, vice chair of the Boston School Committee. Mr. Jean Roundtree, second, um, secondary school superintendent at Boston Public Schools. Jessica Tang, president of the Boston Teachers Union. Mr. Jose Valenzuela, educator at Boston Latin Academy. Ms. Jerry Robinson, chair of the school committee and Ms. Rafaela Polanco Garcia, member of the school committee. I would also like to take an opportunity to acknowledge the BPS Office of Special Education as our co-sponsor for today and for the incredible outreach they did to ensure such a wonderful turnout. And, to, and, and thank you to all of you for participating to do just the same and getting folks here um, engaged. I will, I'm going to invite um, Dr. Nadine um, Erickson, Senior Advisor for Special Education to say a few words. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. This is Nadine Ekstrom speaking. The Office of Special Education is delighted to co-sponsor this morning's listening session. I want to encourage our members of SPEDPAC for sharing in this important work and ensuring a great turnout this morning and to also thank our students and families for engaging in this important forum. Back to you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor, you're on mute. Goodness, sorry about that. This is Councilor Mejia speaking. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eckerson. I would now turn it over to Dr. Pignato, um, who will kick us off with the agenda. This is Carleen Pignato speaking. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Yes, let's turn our attention now to the task at hand. The search for the Boston Public School Superintendent is one of the most important decisions of our community. In fact, of our entire community can make. To do this well, we need your input. In addition to being able to provide public comments tonight, this morning, please note that comments in the chat will be shared with our committee, as well as written comment you'd like to send, which can be emailed to superintendentsearch at bostonpublicschools.org. 
We also have a community survey we encourage our Boston public school community to take. This will be added to the chat, but also know that we will email it to all participants. Our goal is to have a new district leader in place by the end of this school year. These listening sessions are one of the first steps. Your feedback will be reviewed by the search committee as well as external search firm. We will then use this input to draft an updated superintendent job description. After posting the position throughout April and into May, the search firm will complete initial vetting and background checks on candidates. Then the search committee will review applications and select candidates to interview in confidential executive sessions. Following these interview rounds, the search committee will then select finalists for public presentation. In early to mid-June, the school committee will announce finalists and a schedule for public interviews, which will be another great opportunity for our community to weigh in on this critical decision. In late June, following public interviews for finalists, the school committee will vote on which candidate to offer the position of superintendent. Information on each step will be posted all along the way and can be found at bostonpublicschool.org backslash superintendent search. At this time, I will turn the microphone to Miriam who will moderate our public comment process. When public comment is complete, we will wrap up with some reminders about additional ways the public can be and stay involved. Miriam? Thank you, Dr. Pinado. This is Miriam speaking. We will now move to the public comment portion of our session. Please note that we have created three questions to guide our feedback collection. The questions, which we will drop in the chat soon, are the following. What are the three most important qualities or experiences our next superintendent should hold? What question would you most like a candidate for the position to answer? How can the next superintendent partner with the community to be successful? To participate, please use the raised hand feature and we will call on you to speak. You may find this feature on the bottom of your screen to the left of where you found the globe icon. Please be sure your name is correctly displayed and that your video is on. In order to hear from as many voices as possible, remarks are limited to two minutes or to four minutes if a speaker needs interpretation support. Note you will find a visual timer, little clock on a screen to aid you. When you speak, please state your name your neighborhood, and your affiliation with BPS. We would also ask that participants only speak once until all who wish to speak have had the opportunity to do so. We will take as many speakers as time allows. And if time permits, we will entertain repeat speakers. The session will end at noon today. If any speakers would prefer to submit comments in writing, please email your comments to superintendentsearch at bostonpublicschools.org or include them in the chat. Now, two notes about the chat before we move forward. If any staff from elected officials are joining us, please introduce yourself in the chat. Kindly, Keep our session norms in mind. Be open, be respectful, be focused. Should comments in the chat become distracting and disrespectful, a moderator will provide a warning. And in order to have a productive experience, if disrespectful comments continue, the monitor will remove the individual from the session and the individual's comments redacted from the posted chat. So here we go. As a reminder, please speak slowly. 
so our interpreters can translate all the information we have to share. And please introduce yourself, your neighborhood, and affiliation with BPS. Let us know if you're a student and from what school, or if you're an alum, an educator, a parent, or a community partner. partner. All voices are welcome. Our first uh, five speakers are Marjorie Pita, Coriana Lewis, Roseanne uh, Tun, Tun, sorry if I um, mispronounce your name, um, Michael Bollier, and John Mudd. So we will go in that order. Marjorie, if you're uh, if you can accept the prompt that will be on your screen and then unmute, we're ready to hear you. Marjorie with us. Okay. Uh, let's go with Coriana Lewis. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Marjorie. Okay. My apologies. No worries. Uh, good morning. My name is Marjorie Pita. I work at the Rafael Hernandez School as a K-1 teacher, and I am a member of the Culturally and Linguistically Sustaining Practices Committee at my school. I am grateful for the opportunity to represent my community today, and we would like to share uh, how we can help this uh, election of the next superintendent to lead uh, the work towards racial justice, inclusivity, and linguistic liberation. During this school year, in collaboration with our students, families, and staff, we have been working with the guidance and support of Ed Besters to support our vision of deepening our anti-racist and inclusive practices. Through this work, our data validates that uh, to make real change, the superintendent has to be a fearless leader who can handle and also appreciates pushback. Someone that can listen with empathy, understanding, and one who goes beyond words, but takes a strategic action that centers on the voices, interests, and the needs of those more impacted by the district decision-making and policies in a district with almost more than a, almost half of its students are multilingual. It is important that the next superintendent has the experience serving multilingual students and has firsthand lived the multilingual experience in our country. Our stakeholders have made it clear that students need and deserve to see themselves reflected in positive positions of power that they can aspire to. So our questions for the next superintendent is, how are you planning to put together a knowledgeable team specifically for dual language programs who can work shoulders to shoulder with you and the people in the district to support the eight dual language schools in our district? So we can stop feeling that we are just one piece of the puzzle that, comp that makes up Boston Public Schools. But we are an essential part of the puzzle. We complete it. Above all, that our students cannot only be told that they belong in our schools and societies, but also start experiencing the real meaning of it, feeling seen, connected, supported, and proud. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marjorie. And next, we'll hear from Coriana Lewis. You can unmute. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. All right. Uh, my name is Coriana Lewis Bradford, and I thank you all for the opportunity to share this morning. Um, I am a product of two Boston public school teachers who, um, though now de deceased, I carry their torch as a, a BPS educator. I'm also a product of Boston public schools, um, coming up through many, many different uh, Boston public schools, but um, 
also Boston Latin School, where I am now a teacher. Um, so Boston Public Schools have a very near dear uh, place in my heart. And um, as an arts educator, I would like to address the um, the question, how can the next superintendent partner with the community to be successful? And my hope is that they would prioritize quality, culturally responsive arts education for every student through continuing the BPS commitment to BPS arts expansion, the multi-year private and public effort led by Ed Vesters, who's been so, um, so helpful as well as the mayor's office, local foundations, schools, and the arts and culture community. Uh, also continue to maintain Boston Public Schools as a leader in arts education, both nationally and as a model that other cities have sought to emulate. And lastly, my hope is that they will support the vital role that arts teachers, teaching artists, uh, arts institutions and youth arts organizations play in the education development and support of Boston Public School students and their communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Roseanne Tung. You can unmute. Hello. Good morning. I'm a member of the English Learner Task Force and the parent of a recent BPS alum. I'm here to talk about one of the most important qualities our next superintendent should have, a vision for graduating every student proficient in at least two languages and a track record of implementing that vision. Notice I did not say a vision for graduating every student proficient in English only. I'm the daughter of immigrants from China. They left China due to war, came to the US for education and raised me in, a, in the South during a time when the Raleigh, North Carolina census included only black and white racial categories. Growing up there, survival meant assimilation, but assimilation is a trap. Assimilation means loss, loss of our names, history, traditions, loss of language, which is a part of all those things and more because language is culture. Like me, half of BPS students have a first language other than English and more than half speak a home language other than English. We need a paradigm shift in which we see these facts as an asset not a deficit. Our students bring to school tremendous familial, cultural, and linguistic capital that could advantage them in future work and civic participation if the system valued this wealth. Thus, one way to identify the best superintendent for our city is to ask candidates questions like, what is your vision for supporting native language literacy? How have you collaborated with families and communities to foster strong native language literacy and English? How have you recruited and retained faculty and staff who are proficient to teach content in at least two languages? The ideal candidates will answer these questions with concrete successes from their own practice. If the search committee prioritizes the success of our multilingual learners, including those with disabilities, BPS will be better positioned to fulfill its mission. And rather than lose their first language like I did, our students will still be able to communicate with relatives and share their histories, culture, and language with their communities and with their children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Michael Bullier next, and I'll just um, mention a few more names to be ready. After Michael, we'll have John Mudd, Jonathan Reoven, Bernadette Manning, and Roger Author. 
Michael, you can unmute. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Bullier, and I'm the proud principal of the Mozart Elementary School in Rosendale. I have been an educator in BPS for 13 years. Um, and when I joined BPS as a school leader, or rather moved into that position, the BPS problem of practice read, BPS does not consistently provide authentic learning opportunities for our students who are most marginalized to develop into self-determined independent learners, able to pursue their aspirations. Our failures lead to disengaged students and significant achievement gaps. Since 2016, when I entered school leadership in BPS, I have served as a principal under three superintendents. Throughout those three superintendencies, I have witnessed BPS make intentional moves towards racial equity, including the prioritization of the Office of Opportunity Gaps, revisions to policy, including the grading system, exam school process, and inclusion, racial affinity groups for central office staff and school leaders, implementation of equity roundtables across the district, application of the racial equity planning tool, school leader professional development focused on anti-racist work, and intentional hiring practices to ensure more BIPOC and multilingual educators are in our schools. In my experience, the more we do this work, the more we realize how much more work there is to do in order to fully realize and address the BPS problem of practice that we identified in 2016. As we identify superintendent candidates, I sincerely hope that we look for a leader who will prioritize racial equity and continue to advance our efforts towards becoming an anti-racist institution. There is still much work to do, including instructional work that ensures our tier one teaching and learning supports all students to meet or exceed grade level expectations in the least restrictive environment. After all, equitable educational opportunity is the most important lever for racial equity. In order for this work to happen, however, the next superintendent will need to articulate a clear vision for applying an anti-racist lens to teaching, learning, and decision-making that includes leveraging our existing racial equity practices. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have Tan Mud next. You have to accept the prompt on your screen uh, and then you can unmute. Vou pode trabalhar o microfone de mundo. John, are you with us? Did I, did I make it? Yay, welcome. Hey, okay, sorry. Uh, Councillor Mejia and members of the committee. My name is John Mudd. I'm a resident of Cambridge and a longtime education advocate in Boston. Uh, I want to thank the committee for keeping elimination of opportunity and achievement gaps at the top of the goals for the new superintendent in the draft job description. Here, I just want to make a couple of suggestions and emphasize two policy issues. One, the new BPS policy commitment of access to native language for multilingual learners and multilingual learners with disabilities needs to be explicitly recognized as a commitment of the new superintendent, and it isn't yet. Thus, in the fourth bullet under academic challenges on page three of the draft description, I would add something so it would read, successfully educating a high proportion of multilingual learners with diverse native languages and then add including a system-wide shift from English immersion to providing access to native language and bilingual education. Candidates may not know that Massachusetts was one of the states that adopted the question two UNS amendment, which required English immersion, but this has been superseded by the Look Act that allows access to native language. Developing and implementing a plan should be a specific goal of a new superintendent and should be explicitly included in the job description. Secondly, I also applaud the committee for explicitly recognizing multilingual learners with disabilities as one of the marginalized groups in the document. But this group should receive its own highlighted bullet under the listing of academic challenges. 
add a bullet that would read something like, quote, developing and implementing plans with access to native language for multilingual learners with disabilities. They are the lo lowest performing group of students in the system. There are 4,000 of them, and they comprise fully one third of all special education students. Superintendent candidates should know that they will be expected to develop and implement a plan with access for native language for these students. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you, John. I wanna remind our speakers who have written testimony to please also send those via email if you can. Um, so thank you so much for, for your comments. We have Jonathan Riovan next. After you accept the prompt on your screen, you can unmute. Sorry, that took a minute. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. This is Jonathan Rio VM. And um, oh, there's my video. Yeah, I live in Hyde Park and I'm the adoptive parent of two uh, learning disabled students in Boston. <clears throat> Um, I kind of want to start answering the question with a question because I think that I don't understand all the structural problems that have caused Boston to fail so many kids for so many years and that have caused so much turnover in this position of superintendent. Um, I mean, there was a clear MOU with Desi that just was, as far as I can tell, ignored. Uh, and when it comes to uh, special education and English language learners, um, there's been a lot of effort in terms of hiring staff, um, a little bit of building improvements, but I just don't understand. What is it that's causing so much turnover? Why are people leaving? Um, is it the mayor's office? Is it the city council? Is there a lack of a budget? The, I mean, Boston is a wealthy city. We have a huge budget, but my kids haven't been getting what they need and I'm obstructed continually in, in trying to get what they need. Um, so I assume there are budget considerations, but I just don't know. What, why are people failing? Um, so I, I guess my, my thought about answering the question is we would need someone who's maybe more political, more, more of an advocate, someone who has a very strong voice, um, can go toe to toe with the mayor, with the city council, with the school committee, and uh, educate the, the general population of Boston, uh, many of whom don't have kids in BPS. Uh, and don't understand what the needs for the district are. So there would be someone who can do a lot of educating and advocating um, because without, without the political support behind this position, I, I would assume that anyone would struggle. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I'm gonna name uh, the next few hands of our speakers. We have Benedette Manning, Roger Osser, Judith Baker, and Carrie Donahue. So Benedette, whenever you're ready, you can unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, welcome. And good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been a math teacher in Boston Public Schools for over 25 years. Uh, I'm, I am currently a resident of Cambridge. Most of my years have been in pilot, either pilot school, Fenway High School, and currently I'm at Boston Day and Evening Academy. Um, Boston Day and Evening Academy is the largest alternative education school in the district. We have students aged 17 to 22 years old. We focus on families, mental health, um, alternative, uh, alternative, alternative career and college pathways, 
and um, we tailor our educational classes um, curriculum to the needs of our students. I'm here asking that the committee seek hiring a, a superintendent who is experienced in alternate education uh, and or is committed to hiring an assistant superintendent of alternative education. And hopefully that that assistant superintendent or the superintendent can support the big dreams that we hold for our students um, in our school and other alternative education schools in Boston. Thank you for allowing me to express this suggestion. Thank you so much for coming today. We have Roger Osser next. After you see the prompt on your screen and you accept it, you can unmute. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Sorry, oh, there's my video, I apologize. Um, well, thank you, um, the committee, for uh, hosting this. And I'm, it's uh, fortuitous that I'm following Ms. Manny from BDA, which I think is an amazing representative of the Alternative Education Network. Um, my name, as it says, Roger Oser. I'm the uh, head of school of a small alternative education program called the William J. Osagai Recovery High School. Uh, we focus on serving young people who've been impacted negatively by drugs and alcohol. Um, and I really, as following up on Ms. Manning's comments, really wanted to emphasize the importance of the Alternative Education Network and the hope that we can uh, continue to raise up and elevate uh, uh, this work uh, in the district. And, you know, for our network, you know, our goal is to provide a space uh, for learning mo models designed uh, to meet the students' needs not met in traditional settings. Uh, we have an ethic where all the alternative education schools and programs that we work collab collaboratively as a network to identify our strengths, but as, if not more importantly, where the gaps are, who we're missing, who's following through uh, the net. Um, and the 15 schools or programs that are currently part of the network serve 1,250 students. Um, and, you know, as the new superintendent comes aboard, we're really excited about the work that has been led by a lot of the school leaders in the Alternative Education Network and people in the central office around an accountability framework. Uh, where we have developed some standards that can help measure the success that young people are having uh, in alternative education, as Roger, well as identify. Sorry, can I ask you to just slow down a little bit for our interpreters? Thank oh, you so you, much. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. Sorry about that. I'm excited uh, to um, the accountability education framework that we that we've developed um, that we want. Uh, the new superintendent to be able to jump in on and 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 uh, be involved in, and I just like to end just following up on a on a few remarks earlier. I I really would like to emphasize and raise up the comments of uh, Michael Follier, uh awesome headmaster, uh, principal in the elementary school level about the importance of continuing the racial equity work that even despite the transitions that we've had has gained a lot of traction in the network. Um, and then the parent, Jonathan, who spoke, I just want to say, I just want him to know, and I, I want the new superintendent, whoever that is, to know that the people who work in the schools, the school leaders, the teachers, we're committed to supporting the next candidate. We understand how high the stakes are. We want that person to be successful. Um, we want that person to do well, because if they do well, the network, that, you know, the district does well, the families and students do well. So as the new superintendent comes in, just want him or her to know that Alternative Education Network is ready to roll, uh, to work with them. Uh, to help support our young people and families. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have Ms. Judy Baker next. You can unmute when you're ready. Thank you very much. I have just one suggestion, but it's a very strong one. And that is that the new superintendent be totally dedicated to revitalizing technical vocational education in Boston. Only 40% of our kids go on to college. I would hope it's more, but all of the rest of those kids need strong skill education preparation for a job market to which they have no access. This has been true for the last 50 years. Black and brown students have been excluded from highly skilled jobs all over Metro Boston. There's no excuse for it. If we were to hire a director a citywide director for vocational education who would 
institute a program starting in grade at least grade four and five where kids got hands-on uh, motivational uh, education to look seriously at the jobs of the next 30 years, we would have a different population in Boston. Otherwise, we have kids who are um, destined to be poor, destined to be in jail, destined to have to be retrained later on, and it's a crying shame. I certainly hope that this superintendent is committed to revitalizing the system that is moribund, that is not working for our kids, and that our kids deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Baker. I'm going to read the next uh, few hands. We have Carrie Donahue is going to be our next speaker. And after Carrie, we have Ruby Reyes, Jill Kentrowitz, Allison Ramick, and Amanda Govan. Um, so let me see. We have Carrie, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, members of the search committee. My name is Carrie Donahue. I work at the Boston Schools Fund, a nonprofit organization that works to expand access and opportunity to high quality education with a focus on black and Latino students, English learners, and students with disabilities. We provide funding and technical assistance to more than 30 schools across the city of Boston serving over 20,000 students. Over the past few weeks, we've listened attentively to the views of parents, educators, students, and school partners at forums like this. And it's never been more clear how important the role of superintendent is, especially at this juncture for BPS. And as this committee develops a job description, we'd like to highlight a few priority areas that we hope will be embodied in the next superintendent. First, as many people have spoken to on this call, the next superintendent must have an unapologetic commitment to equity with a clear vision for how to get there for all BPS students, but especially those who have been most historically marginalized. Our system is not currently working to support all students towards graduation and life readiness. And this, we need a leader who is going to tackle that. We've seen many pronouncements and commitments about equity, but not enough tangible progress when it comes to the outcomes. The next superintendent must have proved success in attracting, building, and managing a dynamic and diverse team. There are many challenges across all of BPS. It's a complex organization. One person cannot solve all of the problems, but rather an empowered team that has the skills and experience to be able to tackle things such as restructuring special education, expanding dual language, reimagining the high school experience, fixing buses. Uh, there are many, many things and we need a team to do it. The third thing I'd like to highlight is that the superintendent has to be a strategic collaborator. There are so many organizations and partners available in this city that if only we coordinated better, we would be able to achieve more for kids in Boston public schools. And the last thing that the superintendent must have leadership, communication, and the strategic planning skills necessary to address some major systemic issues facing the district, such as the decline in enrollment and lack of access to high quality schools across all of Boston's neighborhoods. We know this person can't do everything. So we encourage the, school, the committee, the search committee and school committee to send a clear message about what is most important in the next leader. And we look forward to collaborating with you on this process. Thank you, Carrie. Ruby Reyes is next. When you see the prompt, you can accept it and unmute. Um, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm a Dorchester resident. I'm also the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance. I wanted to share the following qualities that were shared in the 2018 superintendent search. We hope you will seek a candidate that has these qualities and priorities as we seek another leader. And we ask that you do not settle for finalists who do not share these qualities. First and foremost, an educational leader, the superintendent should be highly qualified and a fully credentialed educational leader with extensive experience as an educator. The person should possess a clearly defined educational philosophy and vision. The superintendent must have the proven organizational and management skills to lead and implement systems change that improves classroom practices and results for students. 
second dedicated. <clears throat> Ruby, if you can slow down just a tiny bit for our yeah. interpreters, thank you. Dedicated to eliminating, eliminating disparities and ensuring a quality public education for every student. The superintendent must possess the capacity to implement strategies for eliminating opportunity and achievement gaps and for identifying and dismantling institutional racial inequities. Third, committed to authentic community engagement. The superintendent should view families, students, and community members as assets and be prepared to implement shared decision-making and seek out historically marginalized voices. Fourth, a resolute, resolute and advocate for public education. The superintendent should reinvigorate support for public education in Boston through a focus on quality and equity. And number five, able to assemble a cohesive, collaborative, highly skilled central leadership team. The superintendent should ensure that administration is sharply focused on effective delivery of support and services to schools and school leaders, as well as coordinated direction within the overall school district. Please hire someone and select finalists and don't settle. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Next we have Bill Kentrowitz. Kentrowitz, sorry if I mispronounce your name. You can unmute. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Jill Kantrowitz. Um, thank you to this committee and thank you to Councillor Mithia for this forum today. I live in Brighton. I am a BPS parent and also the Director of Advancement at Boston Day and Evening Academy. As you heard from our extraordinary math teacher and leader, Ms. Manning, and you will shortly hear from our head of school, Ms. Allison Ramick, BDEA is the largest alternative education school in this city, serving more than 400 students for whom traditional education has not worked. We are located in Roxbury and we could be serving many more students. We teach a competency-based curriculum that not only honors the need for different education pathways, but makes a deep investment in social emotional support for our students so they can be available to learn the academic side. My question for the new superintendent, how will you prioritize and deeply invest in alternative education in Boston? As the world changes rapidly, so too must we rapidly make room for students who learn better in different models. More specifically, how will you honor the lifelong dedication of teachers like Ms. Manning, who are committed to all students in this city? Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Ramick. Again, sorry if I mispronounced your name. You can uh, uh, accept the prompt and then unmute when you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning, I'm Allison Ramick. Um, Thank you all for being here and great to see you, Councillor Mejia. Um, I'm an, I've been an educator in BPS for 17 years. Um, all of my time has been in alt ed. I began as a teacher, um, moved into being an instructional leader and, and have now been leading BDA um, for the last seven years. And I'm gonna continue the thread that uh, my colleagues have started around what it would look like for a superintendent um, to value and honor alternative pathways for our students. Um, during my time, these 17 plus years, I've seen more than three superintendents, hard to count how many. Um, and what I have seen are two different philosophies regarding alternative ed. Um, there has been one philosophy that many of them have held which that alt ed is a short term solution to fix or support students struggling in our traditional model. And usually this has looked like them supporting small programs in traditional schools. Um, 
students enter these programs and then are expected to return to the traditional model, or these students enter these programs and they're already over age or under credited. Um, and all of these models are always under resourced. We have had the fortune of a few superintendents over my time here that understand the beauty of alt ed as a pathway that provides students with rich wraparound supports, um, innovative and academically rigorous programming. And, the, and it looks um, radically different from our tradi traditional models. Um, and that students in these pathways need them for long-term um, so they can reach their long-term educational goal goals. And I would say in my last 17 plus years in BPS, we've never financially invested in all ed. Um, I think this is um, a, a alarming um, point in our funding model is that we are funded the same way as our traditional schools in terms of our staffing and our facilities look nowhere near our counterparts in our other high schools. So for us, what does it mean to honor or value um, Alt Ed, what, what would we be looking for in the superintendent? Um, as Ms. Manning said, someone that actually has experience leading in Alt Ed. Um, and maybe this is just if they don't have that experience that they're understanding the importance of appointing a high school superintendent um, who could really focus in and support our, the innovation that's happening at the Alt Ed um, uh, pathways. Um, someone that values the lived experience of our students as an asset, not a de deficit. And then lastly, um, as mentioned, someone that's willing to make an investment that would allow us to dream big and invest in a state of art facility that provides wraparound services for our young adults so they can be successful in achieving their diploma and going on to either higher education or career advancing jobs. Um, Alison, if you could wrap up as your time is up and we have other hands, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, so just, I guess the last, I would just say some of the questions is what experience do you have leading all ed? What is your vision for alternative pathways in Boston? And how do you plan to invest in alternative ed? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, just a reminder um, for our next speakers that we still have uh, many hands up. And um, if you go over your two minutes, we would be happy to take your testimony um, in the chat or over email or via the video function um, that uh, I saw my colleagues put the link on the chat. Our next speaker will be Amanda Govan. And after Amanda, uh, we have Kathy Hamilton, Donna Lashes, Irmaris Matias and SH. Those are our next speakers. Um, so whenever our next speaker is ready, you can unmute. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning. My name is Amanda Govan. I am a parent of two BPS students. I have a my daughter goes to Orchard Garden um, School and my youngest goes to Haynes EEC. Uh, I am a product of Boston Public School. I am a student of JJ Hurley and Blackstone School back in the 80s. And one thing I noticed with a lot of this meeting in the past meetings, we're asking a lot of these, um, a lot of these candidates, these lifelong qualities. And the last superintendents that we had, they stayed no more than two years. I would like for the superintendent, as far as the search that y'all are having right now, to actually have a qualification where the superintendent stays at the least three years, at the most five, because we can't have someone that is competent in cultural, educational, and artistic advances if they're only staying nine months or a year and a half and just leaving us high and dry. We already been through a pandemic. We're still in those of the pandemic. We're still trying to bring all of our city and state together. We cannot still be a cradle of higher education, top quality education, world-class education, where many people from different parts of the globe come to, but we cannot get our inner city public schools together. That doesn't necessarily seem fair. That doesn't seem competent. And it doesn't necessarily seem right because you're underserving a lot of the residents that live in Boston around Boston and even in the suburban areas for your metro program, but it's just, it's a loss for the people that been in Boston, live in Boston and love their city 
for people that can come from Africa, India, all different parts of Asia, South America, Canada, and they can receive top class, but residents can't. I don't necessarily feel like that's fair. I don't feel it as though that would be right. But what I'm mainly saying is the person that y'all hire, they have to have at least some qualifications to stay at the least three, at the most five. And then after the end of five years, the community, state, and city come together and review their progress and then ask if they would like to stay for another three or five years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, next, we have Kathy Hamilton. You'll see the prompt on your screen. Um, and after you accept it, you can unmute. Hi, everybody. Kathy Hamilton. Um, thanks for hearing our testimony today. I'm excited about the process and the possibilities. I work with the PIC, have been a partner with the district for 35 years, and since 2004 have co-convened the Youth Transitions Task Force, which is a dropout prevention and re-engagement task force. And um, we've seen a lot of progress over the years. A lot more is needed, especially in the context of the pandemic and the disengagement that that has caused. Um, experience that I'd love to see, and I think most on our task force is experience reimagining high school, as someone put it, leading career pathways work. There's a lot to be done beyond just early college um, to create those pathways. Ditto, ditto everything that Judith Baker said, and also leading alternative education. So some questions that I would ask um, are, what strategies would you adopt to grow career pathways for grades seven to 12 within the district? Um, in the context of serious disengagement that we see currently, what strategies would you use to engage high school students in learning in their school community with particular attention to differentiated learning because not all students learn the same and that kind of blows up in high school in a serious way. Um, also, what strategies would you use to ensure a high quality and diverse portfolio of alternative schools to serve our students who are most often left behind? And most of them, of course, are black and brown. How would you finance alternative schools? How would you ensure that career pathways and alternative ed are prioritized in your leadership structure? I love the comment that someone made about, could we have an assistant superintendent of alternative schools? We currently don't even have a director of alternative schools as we've had for decades. Um, so I thank you for listening. I hope you will take it to heart. And um, I look forward to listening to the rest of the testimony. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we have Donna Lashes next. When you see the prompt and accept it, you can unmute whenever you're ready. Hello, good evening. I'm Donna Lashes. Um, I am a parent, a grandparent, community activist, and I was a product of the Boston Public Schools. Um, I come to you here today to speak to you about the importance of two things that I think the new superintendent must really delve deeper into, family engagement and the anti-racist work we are doing here at the district. The most valuable voice I can bring to you today is my voice as a parent and as a grandparent. I want the new superintendent to be able to send the message and build the opportunities and the access for families all through the district, including down into the classroom, that families are co-designers and co-creators of their child's educational journey that their voices must be amplified in this process, that their voices are equal and valued members of the academic conversations that happens around their growth and the strengths of their children, that it must be asset-based, not deficit-based. I would want the superintendent to ensure that schools are going to build one-to-one -one intentional trusting relationships with families so that they can build that authentic partnership and be, feel valued at that school level. I want us 
as, as a school system and for the new superintendent to really think about um, the avenues for school-based shared decision-making and ensuring that families' voices are equal in that process and that we build the work of the equity roundtables to ensure that that is another access point and opportunity for families to engage in our schools. For me, it is extremely important that we build the opportunities and the access for families to be critical consumers of the work and the transformation of the Boston public schools. And we need to do that in order to have those authentic partnerships and to move to an organization where students and families are an essential part of the work because without the family, you will not have students to educate. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. And thank you for really looking at the most powerful empowering qualified candidate for this position to move forward the work that needs to happen. Thank you, Donna. We're so lucky to have you with us. Um, our next speaker is Irmaris Matias. When you see the prompt on your screen, you can unmute. Hi, my name is Irmaris Matias and I live in South End and I'm a mother of two uh, students who attend to the Osher Garden K Public School. Uh, the, uh, the qualities that I would look for the superintendent is someone uh, who knows, uh, who is familiar with the BPS needs and, um, and also cares about the language uh, equity and someone who's willing to work uh, with parents, teachers, and students to be, um, to be able to have great schools. Also, someone who cares about uh, facilities and uh, conditions, who make sure that all schools are safe uh, for students. Questions that I would like to ask uh, the superintendent will be like, uh, is something that really concerns uh, uh, all parents is bullying in in the nation and also in BPS. As a mother or a kid uh, who experienced bullying before the school, I would like to see uh, what plans the um, the new superintendent will bring to BPS to fight bullying. Also, I would like um, for the new superintendent to bring uh, new ideas in the curriculum for. Uh, ELS students who are uh, to learn other um, languages in middle schools. Um, also, I um, if they can be bring a, a solution for school meals uh, to make it a little bit more appealing for the students because at the moment um, it's a lot of waste of food, and we know hunger in the in this country is a major problem. Also, thank you. Thank you so much, Irmaris. Our next speaker is initials SH. Um, when you see the prompt on your screen, you can accept it and unmute. And I'll just mention that our next uh, few speakers will be Charlie Kim, Robert Jenkins, Edith Bazil, and Lou Finfer. SH, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm just renaming myself. Thank you. All right, good morning. Um, my name is Sonia Harris. I live in Mattapan. I am a BPS parent and a BPS student and an exam school graduate. Um, I like to say that I am evidence that BPS has worked and can work again to serve all students. I will follow on with some thoughts about the superintendent leadership turnover rate. First, I would like to know how the candidate will empower themselves to break the cycle of turnover and push back on politically driven agendas that don't align with the BPS mission and vision for the learning community. Next, um, I don't believe any parent sends their child to school to fail. I also believe school is the, their first job and it should prepare them to compete for jobs in the future. So my other question is, how will the candidate ensure that all students and the district 
have access to a well-rounded curriculum across every grade level, including vocational and life skills as they advance. And lastly, for parent Jonathan, who spoke, I believe, to um, groups prior to mine, um, and for others who want more insight on the turnover rate and the issues, the Herbert Training Institute wrote an article addressing the BPS superintendent turnover. The title of the article is, Boston had a turnstile of superintendents. Why can't BPS keep them? And I think uh, to get some answers to our questions, uh, it would be helpful perhaps to reference that article and um, follow up with more feedback for the panel at the email address that was provided um, earlier during the session. So thank you all for listening and good luck with the search process. Thank you so much, Sonia. We have Charlie Kim next. You can unmute when you're ready. Hello. Can you hear me? Welcome, yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Kim. I'm a resident of the North End, a parent of two daughters in Boston Public Schools. I'm also the co-chair uh, for the school site council at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the treasurer for the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, I have a question for the search committee, kind of on a mechanical question that will lead to, to my comment, and that's on transparency. Asking if the survey, I'm surprised that the survey results on a rolling basis, and then also uh, the metrics on attendance and a summary of comments um, in, in written form uh, from the past meetings uh, and how they roll up into the new red line version of the job description. Um, the reason why I ask is I believe we can consider the superintendent um, is representing the stakeholders of Boston, not only the current 49,000 students of which 11,000 fall under the Office of Special Education and are considered special education students. We have parents, we have what 15,000 teachers, administrators, and a, a, a lot of central office people, but then also the rest of the city. So that would be, my guess, over 60, 70,000 um, people that the superintendent probably would be considered um, representing on stakeholders. We have less than 1,000 people, I believe, that have attended these meetings and maybe some of the results are not coming in because you're overwhelmed with written responses or overwhelmed with survey responses by email. Um, I just still ask that those results um, be released so that we as parents can see um, what the comments are, uh, especially with the fact that this is the last listening session. And we the next time that we parents have the ability to um, comment or give feedback is during a public interview process. Some of the concerns that I have um, in, in addressing um, not understanding the survey results and then also rolling into the, um, the job description is that I would categor categorize things in two uh, streams when people are asking uh, for the new superintendent. One would be the simple legal requirements uh, that fall under the Disabilities Education Act, and then also simple uh, fundamental requirements to get our children to school, feed them, and provide them with infrastructure, um, bathrooms that work, libraries, etc. And then one thing that is unclear to me, but I do hear a lot of um, the people that I highly respect talk about is having the superintendent close opportunity gaps, look at um, uh, changing the way that uh, the schools um, educate uh, people for inclusion, et cetera. That, Charlie, that is out. Yep. Sorry, if you could start wrapping up your thoughts and we will yep. probably uh, allow for a second time if time allows, but your time is up. If you could wrap cool. up, thank you. I will wrap up and just 
submit um, in, in writing, but thank you for letting me know that I'm at my two minutes. I'll submit the rest of it. Okay, thank you so much. And if we have time, you know, after all the hands are up, we'll welcome you um, to speak more in addition to submitting. So thank you for understanding. Our next speaker is Robert Jenkins. You'll see a prompt on your screen. And then after you've accepted it, you can unmute whenever you're ready. Class of 19, Robert Jenkins, class of 1978. A uh, member of the Community Advisory Council, uh, Advisory Council for the District, School Site Council member for Madison Park. I have some points I would like to make out for our next superintendent that they know Boston and they know the entire city and the, the, the structure of Boston. But um, I would like to speak, Madison Park needs an emissions policy. Madison Park has well over 50% or more of our students a special ed or ELL, you know that that to me has been going on as as long as we've had so many superintendents. Uh, uh, also, too, parents, students, and teachers need to be part of the process. I do know that elected officials have been putting, you know, showing up at the school, but it has to be transparency. This is the village raising the village. Safety, our. School police need to be back in the buildings and we need to work with the Boston public. We need to work with the Boston public, the Boston police department, make them part of the team of social workers, liaisons, teachers, uh, you know, community workers, you know, make them part of the team. This is ridiculous. A, a gun at a K to eight school in my neighborhood, that is unacceptable. Unacceptable. That's all I can say on that one. But you know, get the school-based, I mean, get, get the um, community-based organizations and your other city departments to help on that. My next point is family engagement. That's everybody. That's everybody. You know, family engagement is not going on. Parents do not have a clue to what's going on in some schools, in most schools. Uh, as I sit on the school site council, our school site council has gotten a lot better because of me knowing the policies and procedures, but there needs to, the, the school leaders need to know what, how a school site council and school parent councils work, as well as BPS and BTU need to work together. That needs to happen. Um, and also too, having a voice for the sixth to eighth graders, there's no middle schools. With the grade reconfigurations that are going on, you're going six to 12, seven to 12. Those students also need social, and emotional, and academic and athletic uh, uh, opportunities as well. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and also too, this is great on a Saturday. Why uh, the uh, BPS needs to give parents options on being able to attend meetings. That community roundtable on Fridays, there are voices that need to be there teachers, students, parents, community-based organizations, we are working at that time. They need to come out in the, in the, they need to come out on the weekends and they need to give parents more options. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, and uh, I wanna remind our participants today that the Tuesday meetings of the search committee also have time for public comments. So you will find the link on the chat um, thank you to the colleagues that put that on the chat. Um, Edith Bazil is our next speaker. After Edith, we have Lou Fimfer and Lisa Graf. But we still have time for more hands. So if there's anyone else um, who would like to raise their hand, you can feel free to do so. Thank you so much. I don't have any prepared remarks, but I'm happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. What, what I'd like to say is echo a lot of what everyone else has said, but I want to say that history matters. We are not dealing with what is confronting the fueling gap that we have, and it's about history. It's about the history of anti-Blackness. 
When public education was founded in 1635, Black people in the state of Massachusetts were still enslaved. We built institutions that we were denied access to. It began with anti-Blackness. We talk about equity. We talk about a quality guarantee, but what we don't talk about is eradicating anti-Blackness. It started with this and it continues with this with every other group of color who entered that we fought for during the civil rights movement. We fought for rights for everyone, for our Latinx, Afro-Latino brothers and sisters, for our Cape Verdean brothers and sisters, our Haitian brothers and Asian brothers and sisters who came here. We fought for everyone, yet we do not have our rights. So we need to look at the root of what has happened here. This is not about an opportunity gap. This is about an education debt that is owed to Black students. Black students who were denied education uh, from the helm and from the founding of public education and the colonial remnants that continue to oppress Black students. We have a system of white supremacy mindset where there is a belief in Boston Public Schools that only white policymakers can save us. They cannot save us. We need to get rid of that missionary approach to educating majority Black and Brown students. We have white policymakers who are in charge of making decisions, who have not had lived experiences of what it's like to be a person of color, a black and brown person seeking educational equity. We need to start respecting parents. Special education is in completely systemic disarray. It has been and it continues to be. There's been no progress. There's no inclusion. Inclusion is not done right. We need to really begin to identify the problem and talk about racism. Being an anti-racist is not courageous. It is necessary. This conversation is necessary to talk about who has been left behind. So I would say that we need an anti-racist leader who is a cultural insider, who looks like the students and parents who are receiving the education of the system. And we need to stop thinking that we need white policymakers to save black and brown students. It's not happening. And we need to get rid of that white supremacy mindset. The last thing I wanna say is that the, the education is about literacy. Literacy is about liberation. Uh, Frederick Douglass sought his freedom from enslavement through literacy by learning to read. That is something that is not happening in Boston public schools. We need strong a strong literacy foundation in preschool, in early education, we need a leader who has a proven track record of teaching black and brown students, English learners, strong literacy early so that they can access content across different content areas. If you cannot read, you cannot lead your life and you cannot make informed decisions. And so we need to really talk about anti-blackness, eradicating it, we need an agenda for black students, which means if we have an agenda for black students, we have an agenda for our Afro-Latino students, for our Dominican students, for our- Ms. Basile, I'm sorry. So I'm just wrapping up by saying mm -hmm. that anti-blackness is, is, is what we need to tackle in BPS and that's what's holding our students back. We need to pay that education debt owed to our black students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Basile. Um, Lots of comments in agreement with you on the chat. We appreciate your passion all the time. We have Lou Fimfer next. And after Lou, we have Lisa Graf, Suhei Scannell, and Sharon Kuhns. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for organizing this hearing. My name is Lou Finfer. I'm with the Massachusetts Communities Action Network, which is a statewide federation of community improvement organizations. I'm gonna to move to a different room away from my dog who's barking. Um, and um, we've worked extensively for many years on trying to strengthen vocational education around the state. And I wanna underlie you know, some of the comments that were made by Judith Baker and others. Um, Madison Park has a couple of hundred vacant seats now. Um, Kevin McCaskill did a good job in reducing that. It used to be closer to 500, but 200 plus is still a tragedy. 
step back from it. In the other cities' vocational schools, there are a total of 6,000 6, students on waiting lists. They have waiting lists in their schools. And in Boston, for years and years and years, we've had vacant seats because of the lack of support from BPS and the superintendents enough um, for vocational education. If you graduate from Madison Park with the skills you learn there, even if you don't go beyond that, you will get a 50,000 a year job. If you graduate from a district high school and do not go beyond that, you get a 25,000 a year job. And a lot of opportunities in life stem from that initial situation with your jobs and what that means for you and your family going forward. So I just wanna underline the need and it can be done um, if there's the attention given and the support given, uh, it can be done. And there are groups like the Friends of Madison Park and the Champions of Madison Park who are giving support, but they need a, a deep partner in the next superintendent and the whole BPS system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Lisa Graf, you're our next speaker. You should see a prompt on your screen. And after that, you can unmute. Hi, Miriam. I, it's Ju Councilor Julie. I'm here. I can't hear Lisa, so I'm not sure if there's something wrong on my end. Mm -hmm. Lisa, are you with us? I see that she's on mute, but I don't know if she's having difficulty. Um, maybe while we wait for Lisa, let's go with Suhei. Hola. Hola. Hola, buenos días. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Oh, buenos días. Mi nombre es Ujey Estanel. Soy madre de tres niños. Una de ellas va a la escuela pública de Boston Herley. Y el, lo, que, lo principal que busca dentro de las cualidades que busca un nuevo superintendente es que sea un líder. Un, una perso un superintendente con la visión y la vocación de servicio. Suje, un momento, déjeme ayudarle a traducir al inglés para los demás intérpretes. Ah, un momento. Yo estoy en español, tengo que cambiarme de... No, no, usted se puede quedar aquí. Okay, Pero yo le voy a ayudar a, a traducir. Uh, dice que es una madre de cuántos niños? De tres niños. I'm a mother of three children in Boston Public Schools. She's being translated on the English Channel. OK, great. Oh, ya está bien. Puede continuar. OK. Disculpa, que el bebé vino en un momento de apropiado. <risa> ya. Uh, lo principal que busco en un superintendente es que sea un gran líder, que tenga la visión y la vocación de servicio, que apoye la diversidad en los maestros, que continúe apoyando y asignando recursos al acceso al idioma para que los padres que no puedan hablar inglés reciban interpretación de calidad. Eh, debe tener experiencia en el sistema escolar de Boston, ya que haya sido estudiante, tenga hijos en las escuelas o sea un maestro. Eh, debe venir con un gran plan para los estudiantes con necesidades especiales. Uh, que su trabajo y vocación le permita influenciar. ¿Me escuchan? Oh, perdón. Que su trabajo y vocación le permita influenciar en las personas que toman decisiones. Um, en especial, que entienda lo difícil que son las rentas de, de viviendas aquí en Boston. Y que tenga como base saber que un techo es una condición vital del aprendizaje. Perdón. Eh, eh, que trabaje con, con entusiasmo de incluir a los estudiantes y sus familias, o sea, crear juntas estratégicas con las familias, los niños y, y los maestros, que continúe ampliando la, la familiaridad para que cada, la familia cada día esté más involucrada. 
que venga con ideas vanguardistas, o sea, que estén a los niveles de, oh, como estamos en estos tiempos, ya de, después de la pandemia, y que abogue y defienda nuestras escuelas como si fuese parte de su familia propia. Buenos días, muchas gracias por escucharme. Disculpen lo inconveniente con el bebé. No worries. Uh, we, we like all the voices, including the voices of your babies. So thank you for your support. We have Sharon next. And after Sharon, we have Vivian Ortiz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. I wasn't, I didn't have planned remarks, but I am a parent of two kids at the Hernandez. I live in Roslindale. And I, um, I was coming to this meeting partly to hope to learn some of the criteria that other people are looking for. Um, for me, one, I, I didn't fully understand um, the circumstances around Dr. Caselius leaving, if that was more her choice or feeling that she wasn't doing a good job. Um, I did hear some feedback that some parents of color felt like a lot of her Um, she said a lot of the right things about equity, racial equity, which is something that I care deeply about. Um, but I had the feeling from some that maybe it felt more like lip service. My hope is that for the next superintendent, that they would take a different approach to, um, to principals and to teachers, more of a, a partners and collaborators as opposed to scapegoats is a little harsh, but I did feel in some moments that Um, I, I think the school did a great job throughout the pandemic, but I did worry in some moments that any negative feedback would be seen as, you know, criticism of the school when really we're working under such difficult circumstances, all of us. Um, so I would hope that um, the new superintendent would, um, would not take a punitive approach to schools that are struggling. And somewhat related to that, I would hope that they would take another look at this idea of the tiers and this ranking system of schools that seems to me very problematic based as it is on test scores, which we all know do not reflect the teaching or learning happening inside these buildings. And for parents who don't know a lot about it, it can be really problematic when they feel like, oh, well, I lost the lottery. Now I'm going to move to Milton or now I'm going to, and obviously I'm talking here about parents of privilege, but, I, and you know, that doesn't, shouldn't be the main aim of the district, but I think it is a factor. I think that, um, you know, communicating, and it sends a message to everyone to, to have these schools ranked by tier. I'm probably over time, so I will stop there. Um, but thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Sharon. We have Vivian Ortiz next, but we still have time um, for additional testimony. So if anyone um, who hasn't spoken or would like to speak again, would like to raise their hand, um, we encourage you. I see a few hands already, so thank you all. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to join this. I am not a BPS parent. I am not a product of BPS. I live in Mattapan. I am a resident and I am a person that works actively with schools with the Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program as a person that encourages students to walk and bike. And I am the only person that has spoken on this topic and it has to do with transportation. Um, Boston Public Schools, The priority or the majority of the students I know and understand ride buses to get to school, but a lot of the observations that I make as a person that um, does not own a car and chooses to walk and bike is my primary form of transportation and do see what's happening at the schools because, as I said, I do spend time in the campuses teaching students about crosswalk safety and bike safety and things, is that we have an attendance problem for families that are able to drive their students to school. I have been at schools where I have seen students arriving to campus an hour late because of the fact that they're just getting dropped off. And we know that there are benefits to students walking and biking. We would like to be able to do more work within the Boston Public Schools. I'm hoping that we're going to have a leader that will be aligned with the city's goals to make walking and biking other forms of transportation accessible and and a priority within our community. Um, we have too many folks that value driving cars and we need to make sure that we are getting ready for or preparing for the climate crisis that we are in right now and value the fact that we do have students that can walk and bike, but a lot of our parents don't feel safe in doing that. 
So aligning better with the Boston Transportation Department, with the Boston Public Health Commission, to make sure that we are advancing and talking about having our students walking and biking. Yes, students do ride buses, but they are walking to that bus stop. And we know that students are riding their bicycles after school, during the summer. And oftentimes when I talk to parents, they have no idea that this is a free program that's offered. We can come in and talk to students about how to walk to school, walking to school with friends. We know that that helps with attendance. It helps with mental health. Those of us that have either found the benefits of walking and biking during this pandemic, know that it's healthy for us, it's beneficial for us, it's a social way for us to be able to interact with neighbors and friends, and it works for the climate and for the planet, and we need to align with the city's goals to make it a more bike and walk friendly community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. Our next few speakers will be Ann Walsh, Gloria West, Clarissa Rodriguez, and Benjamin Helfat. Hi, this is Anne. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a BPS parent. Um, my kid is in 10th grade. Uh, my second kid, my older one, has graduated. Um, there have been five superintendents while my child has made her way through school. So um, we're a little bit tired of being in this conversation as lovely as you all are. But, um, and I feel like we have three months, like in three months, we're not gonna find a unicorn, right? Like we want all of these things. Um, so for me, I'm looking for somebody who has both confidence and humility and, and knows what they know and knows what they don't know. Um, so, to be honest, like, I think we need somebody who knows Boston, knows BPS. Like we can't spend another two years waiting for somebody to figure us out. We're our own special kind of weird. And like, people already need to know like what, how we go about things here. Um, so I want somebody who understands the context and somebody who's a strong instructional leader, right? Somebody who's been in a classroom and knows how that is. Somebody who's led a school and knows how that works. Um, someone has demonstrated commitment and competence in inclusion and equity work, um, and who is flexible and creative in models. Traditional schools, I would argue, don't work for most kids. And so having really creative approaches and, uh, and supporting um, educators who are being creative and meeting their kids is really where I would like to see somebody shine. Um, and see family engagement and social emotional supports, not as extras that you add on when you have time, but are just core to how schools work and how education is done. Uh, so those have to be embedded. And I, with that, like if you're gonna get all that, I think it's really impossible to ask somebody to also have all those other operational skills. We know a lot of organizations that work well when you have an instructional leader and an operational leader. And I would love to see somebody who has the humility to say, I know what I don't know. And I'm open to asking the city, can you take on facilities management, right? Like, can the city who already handles all the public works and handles all the, the public buildings, can they absorb the staff of facilities for BPS and they handle buildings and facilities and buses and all these operational things at a macro level, hearing from the school so that the superintendent and their core staff at the bowling building are thinking about teaching and learning. And they're not thinking about replacing pipes so that kids can drink clean water in their building. Um, so being able to, to have the humility to offload responsibilities that aren't central to teaching and learning and trusting that the actual experts in that work can figure that stuff out at the city level um, and then collaborating with other experts in the community for those spots in between that, they, that I haven't figured out, but that they figure out, oh, we need help with that too. So confidence in what they know, and that needs to be instruction above all else, and humility to ask for help and collaborate. Um, and they gotta, they gotta already be from here. And I've never said that on a superintendent search before, but we just gotta get going. Like we don't have time. Thank you, Anne. I'm sorry your time is up, but yeah. if you have more comments, feel free to share on the chat or over email. We have Ms. Gloria West next. Clarissa Rodriguez after her. Whenever you're ready, Ms. West, you can unmute. Hit the right button. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Started. 
All right. Good morning. My name is Gloria West. I am a parent, grandparent, and now a part of the BPS staff as a family liaison. I'm here today to speak about just the passion and the love for the district. As a parent in the district for 44 years, my heart is aching not for the staff, but more so for the families and the students who again are suffering because every time we make progress we're back to zero again and that's not fair to the students that's not fair to the families that's not fair to the community that we serve at the end of the day we i can remember when my oldest who's now 30 some years 36 years old was at o'brien when they folk, when we focused on the whole child and made sure that the family and the student was taken care of, attendance, parent involvement, parent involvement, parent engagement, and test scores went through the roof because we focused. We were a community that cared, cared not just about the staff, not just about the students, but about everybody. And I think about all the staff or the teachers of color that have left as a result of things that have transpired in the district. We don't have teachers and principals of color that look like our students in these schools. So what are we going to do? We're back to ground zero again. And once again, we're saying, okay, bear with us because we know what's best. While everything everyone said is great, at the end of the day, where's the heart and the passion and the commitment to our students and families? None of us would be here if it was not for them. At the end of the day, when do we make students and families the priority? When do we say what's in West, West Roxbury is just as well good enough and needs to be in Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury? When do we say enough is enough and we say it's time for us to get it right? And every time we start making progress to get it right, we back away or we say, you got to go. I've seen too many, too many superintendents, and I could name them all if, if we had time. But at the end of the day, we could talk about leadership. We could talk about what is needed. We could talk about the changes that we want. We can create this ideal person. But the ideal person is each and every one of us doing our part and holding each other accountable for what needs to get done. We can't build and make someone perfect for the district. We are the district and we need to make those changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Gloria. We have Clarissa Rodriguez, Benjamin Helfat, and Samira S. will be our next speakers. And after that, we will probably start transitioning out. It's 1144. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Ok, bueno, buenos días. Mi nombre es Clarissa Rodríguez. Tengo cuatro niños en la Escuela Pública de Boston. Y yo quiero un superintendente que cuando llegue a su posición, no solo sea sentarse en una silla y ver papeles y todo lo que ha pasado con el otro. Alguien que visite las escuelas, que sea empático con los estudiantes y que pueda ver con sus propios ojos lo, la necesidad de los niños, de los padres, de los maestros, porque yo he vivido con carne propia lo que era hacer un mal manejo con mis niños que tienen IP, dos de ellos, y que tengan buen buen manejo de cuando hacen los papeles, de mi idioma principal que es español, y cuando me han hecho los papeles, he tenido que visitar cuatro o cinco escuelas que mis niños han pasado de escuela en escuela, necesito más eh, que tengan un profesional más adecuado cuando me hagan el IP, y una traducción correcta. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Benjamin Helfet, you are our next speaker. Good morning. Um, my name is Benjamin Helfat. I'm the head of school at Boston Adult Technical Academy. And I'm only going to speak briefly because uh, my colleagues have said it very well from both BDA and Ostagai. But I think it's really important that as we look for a superintendent, we're really thinking about alt ed. Um, alternative education has uh, about 1,200 students in it. 
And these are students who would be dropouts. They are not, they are students who have left the system looking for something new, something different that's going to work for them. And the alt ed system, um, we've really appreciated the commitment in the past to uh, alternative education, but this commitment has to have some investment. It has to have some leadership. We need to be thinking about a portfolio of schools to meet all of those needs that are coming out. Anything that happens to the high schools in Boston Public Schools affects the enrollment at Alt Ed. Um, if there's something that's that's happening, students are going to react, and that's going to change the enrollment that we have as we're in transition, as we're coming off of a pandemic. That is directly affecting our numbers, and it's directly affecting the work we have to do. And I think that if we're not thinking about the leadership in those spaces, and we're not thinking about the investment in those spaces, we're going to be failing more students. And Bada is here to support the next superintendent. We're here to support the work that's being done, but we need the investment to do that. Um, and we really want to make sure that all students are being served. As we talk about opportunity gaps, the students we get are the students who would be dropouts. Um, we want to make sure we are supporting them and we're supporting all of those students. Um, Bada is over 60% ELL learners. This is a huge need. Um, we have a huge amount of diversity in the alt ed space, and we need the support to make that happen. So thank you guys so much for all of the work you're doing and, and good luck with the search. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benjamin. Samira S is our next and final speaker. Hello, can you hear and see me? Yes, welcome. Okay, hi, my name is Samira Smith. I live in Boston. I have a student in Boston Public School. I have a graduate going to Boston Public School and I'm also a graduate of Boston Public School, but I also attended most of my years down South in Alabama in schools. So I just wanna start off saying as a parent, um, I am guilty of not being involved as much as I, as I believe I should. Um, I did give it a shot when my son was in elementary school, but it just felt like your presence is needed, but not your voice of concern. And I feel like that there should be a way to encourage parents to be more involved in these meetings and what is going on within the Boston Public Schools. I also feel that the students need to be involved. I just spoke to my daughter a couple of nights ago about this meeting. She was not aware of these meetings. And her peers were not aware as well. And I feel like the student voice needs to be heard because they are the future and they are the one who has to be present in school every single day. Um, when it comes to the superintendent, I think that she should be a bridge between the teachers and the students. Um, the teachers should be go under evaluation on a yearly basis. I think there should be feedback from the students of, of all the teachers, like a survey. And I think there should be a suggestion box in every school that the students could give feedback about the teacher and how their relationships and the teacher can be improved. Um, as my daughter, she's advanced in her in English. That's one of her strongest um, subjects, but math is her weakest. And sometimes she gets bored in class. And I think there should be a way to keep students interest or find out why they're like, act, they're having behavior issues, I guess I would say um you know how to how to make the class more interesting or how to cater to students who are a little ahead of other students in their classroom also think that with um the food for me i have to cook my daughter breakfast and i have to pack her lunch every day and there shouldn't be no reason why i should have to do that and there's a lot of parents out there who aren't able to um fix their students breakfast or pack their lunch they're not, they may not have the funds or they may not have the time. And there needs to be, students have been complaining about the school lunches for years and nothing has changed. And there needs to be a change in that. Some, my child, both of my children will um, stay hungry all day because they refuse to eat the food. And nutrition is important, especially for their health and for their brain. Um, also, I believe that children should start learning a language starting in elementary school, not high school. And if, if not elementary school, it should start no later than middle school. 
every um, Boston public school should have computer courses as a requirement. They should um, also be learning how to write um, in cursive as well. I don't know why they took that out of school, but that's important. A lot of documents are still in cursive and students are not, my children cannot read cursive and I can, and I don't think that's okay. Um, Mira, I'm sorry to cut you off. Your your time is a, uh, is done, but if you could wrap up and or um, share your thoughts, your additional thoughts in the chat, that would be great. Okay, I just, one last thing. Mm -hmm. um, there has been 155 million funding so far that has given to Boston Public Schools, and I think there needs to be transparency of where how these funds are being allocated. So, and that's all I have to say. I'll submit my rest of my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and all our speakers. That concludes our public comment session for today. I, uh, Councillor Mejia and Dr. Pignato, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Miriam. Y muchas gracias a todos, um, all of those who have participated. Um, this has given me life as a BPS parent, as a BPS graduate, to see the level of engagement um, really speaks volumes, not to just the deep commitment that we must make to ensuring that the voices that we heard today get uplifted. So thank you for your contribution. Um, we, we've heard that uh, we need to focus on making sure that we're supporting our alternative heads. Um, schools are vocational, really pouring resources into our most vulnerable learners. Um, so really encouraged by all of the amazing feedback. But before we close, um, I want to turn it over to my um, co-host to see if um, you wanted to say any final remarks. I do want to remind folks that there's still many ways to participate. Make sure that you email um, your comments or um, fill out the survey. All of the information is in the chat. Um, and on behalf of my co-host, I'm going to skip, I'm going to, I'm going to actually ask my co-host Dr. Paganto, to see if you have any final remarks, just because I think it's important for us to both close out. Yes, thank you. This was another very, very powerful session. Uh, what really stood out today was the need to really deeply and authentically invest in alternative education, um, because students who attend these schools are really the most, some of the most marginalized students in, in BPS. Um, we also heard from families about transparency in communication. Um, there were a couple of wonderings about um, why the superintendent left and why do we have to have so many turnovers in superintendents. Uh, we also heard that the superintendent should be um, a strategic collaborator, um, one who needs to have humility uh, to say what they do not know and what they need to know and having really strategic partners in getting the work done. And when we speak of anti-racist work, we need to really do the work and not simply speak of the work. Um, I also heard um, that the person will really need to know what equity means um, and have a full vision on how the work of equity will be carried out, not just spoken about. Um, I heard uh, a lot of managing dynamic changes and, and management um, on how maybe the cabinet would work with the superintendent because it takes more than one person. It also takes uh, school leaders, families, especially families' voices to bring success um, and make, make what is possible out of every student in BPS. And I'll pass it on to you, Counselor. Yes, thank you, thank you. So as you know, the work continues. Um, and I also wanna add one more thing that I heard is around the importance of literacy and making sure that we are uh, leaning into this um, and being really super intentional. So you know we're here for all of it. Um, as the chair of education, as someone who's deeply invested in public education, I am incredibly grateful for everyone who participated today. What an amazing turnout. Um, continue to be engaged, share the video, um, encourage others to participate by filling out the um, survey or um, sending their um, comments via email. So on behalf of the Boston Public School, um, School Committee, the superintendent search and my office, 
Counselor at Large Julia Mejia, the Chair of Education. We thank you um, so very much for participating. Have a beautiful afternoon, and I will end here. Thank you all. Adios. <laughs>